let's just get started and uh, start off by closing your eyes. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about closing your eyes is that you shut out so much of the world and you can really feel your body really well when you close your eyes. So feel your body, make sure you are at ease, you are comfortable. Uh, the idea is in a sense to kind of remove the problems of the body uh, so you can focus on the mind instead. Uh, so just uh, find a nice comfortable posture uh, and then just relax. And just feel your body to start with, uh, just to ensure you haven't got any tensions or tightnesses or problems in the body. Uh, and uh, the best way often to get rid of these problems is just to wait. Uh, wait just very peacefully and quietly, just resting, uh, not really meditating, uh, but just resting and being at ease. Uh. And just uh, try to enjoy the kind of good atmosphere, uh, the atmosphere of being with other people who practice this path. Uh, and often there's a lot of goodwill and kindness in groups such as this. Uh, so tune a little bit into that kindness and goodwill that you have around you. Uh, and as you do that, you create a good feeling inside. Uh, and that good attitude is so important for the meditation to really take off and work. Uh, A large part of meditation practice uh, is just to allow the process to happen by itself. Uh, 
And that happens when you kind of get out of the way yeah, and you just allow things to calm down. Yeah. And a nice simile for this is the idea of sitting on the train. Yeah. And when you sit on the train, you're not the driver, you're the passenger. Yeah. And you allow the scenery to come by outside the window. Yeah. In the same way, whatever happens in a meditation yeah, is like the scenery. Yeah. Things changing, yeah, but not you controlling where you're going. Yeah. Allowing the scenery to move. Yeah. Just standing back, watching. Yeah. And as you watch without any intention or doing, yeah, it tends to calm down by itself. Okay, so coming to the, towards the end already, uh, just take a few moments just to very briefly review the meditation. Uh, and if you do feel a little bit better, even after a short meditation such as this, uh, ask yourself why that is the case. Uh, Okay, so that is the uh, end of the meditation. So please come out. Okay. So uh, is all the all the Buddhists in Bristol, or are there are there a few more uh, lurking around somewhere? <laughs> Yes. You can't hear me very well. Huh? Okay, come closer. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's the front at the very front here. Yeah. Yeah. We promise not to bite or anything like that, you know. So you should be safe. <laughs> it's always a bit scary with monastics. I know what it's like. Like, oh, monastics. Oh, they are really frightening. <laughs> they are weird hairdos and strange clothes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so welcome everyone here. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, I think, what is the title superpower of, of patience? Uh, okay, yeah. And uh, it is actually, it's interesting, in the suttas they have this, uh, 
word is actually called the Kanti Bala. Bala in Pali means like a power, yeah? So Kanti is the, the kind of the word for patience or for forbearance or something like that in the uh, word of the Buddha. So it actually means the power of patience, yeah? So it is considered a kind of power here, yeah? which is interesting here. Yeah? And so maybe we'll try to uncover why it is a power here yeah? and how we can cultivate it during this talk. That's the that's the theory. When I start, when it actually talk happens, we're not sure what's going to happen. It's very uncertain. Uh, so you have to be very patient. Uh. Can you do that? Uh? You can? Okay, well, that means there's nothing to say here. <laughs> Already sorted. No. So uh, um, just, uh, just messing around because I'm a kind of disciple of Ajahn Brahm. He always messes around. So I kind of have, you know, trying to kind of follow, follow up on his. Uh, kind of ways of doing things, but uh, I want to start with just considering the kind of modern society a little bit, because we seem to live at times when there's very little patience around it. Yeah, everything is kind of as instantaneous gratification as we can. Uh, so much entertainment and things available on the internet. Uh, and uh, it seems like we are kind of, we are, we are becoming very uh, short-tempered almost because of these things as well. The internet, you know, uh, creates all sorts of problems for us and all sorts of arguments and people doing all kinds of crazy things. Uh, we're becoming maybe slightly less civilized. Uh, is that true? Yeah. We're becoming less civilized? Maybe, yeah, maybe not. Not entirely sure. But uh, sometimes it feels that way, especially if you are active on the internet uh, and people say all kinds of bad things. And there's a lack of patience, I think, sometimes. Uh, a lack of forbearance, a lack of standing back, a lack of mindfulness, uh, a lack of clarity about what we're doing here. Yeah. And I think that is kind of one of the scourges of uh, our modern life with the internet and all of these kind of things. Uh, so uh, I think it's time to kind of take stock and maybe do things differently, uh, especially if you're interested in spiritual practice of Buddhism. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a good chance to uh, see if we can look at things in a different way uh, and maybe we can become part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. Uh, and that's usually kind of useful to be part of the solution rather than part of the uh, actual problem that we're having here. Uh. And it's kind of interesting. I think it has always been in uh, our kind of humanity. We always want to be, have our satisfaction more quickly, right? We always want to, uh, this idea of instantaneous gratification, it's kind of, it's almost like in our genes, yeah? The quicker we can get things, the quicker we can uh, achieve things, uh, the more kind of the better we think things are, yeah? And so much of our life is about having, making sure we have enough money so when you're hungry, your kind of your fridge is properly stocked, and you can kind of have something to eat straight away, and you have your internet, so you can get whatever entertainment you want, and kind of you want these things as quickly as possible. Yeah. And this is kind of a craving once. Yeah, you want kind of now, now I want the uh, you know the satisfaction for that craving. Yeah, and the uh, if you kind of take that to its uh, uh, kind of final and obvious conclusion. Uh, the obvious conclusion that is having instantaneous gratification, uh, right? Gratification straight away. Uh, that's kind of the ideal. This is what this lack of patience really is kind of leading towards. Uh. But if all your desires were instantaneously gratified, uh, would you be happy? Uh? <laughs> Think about it for a second. Imagine that every desire you have, as soon as you have the desire, bang, that's it. Uh, you're satisfied straight away. Uh. What kind of life would that be? Uh? Would that be a happy life? Uh? Or would it be a life completely without meaning and purpose? Uh, and I think it would actually be the most depressing kind of existence you probably could have, right? If everything is satisfied straight away. Uh, and uh, I think a large part of the reason for that is because so much of our life uh, is actually in the pursuit of these things. Uh, yeah, the purpose of life actually exists in you know, trying to get hold of the things that are important to us. Uh, getting a nice house, getting a nice partner, in life or whatever it might be, that is kind of what life often is about. Uh. So if everything is satisfied straight away, you would probably lie down and just die. Is that right? Uh? What, what do you think? You would die? <laughs> Maybe, right? I, yeah, it's kind of hard to know, right? Uh, so um, so and that to me, I think, actually would happen. If life would become really, really utterly unbearable if everything was satisfied straight away, especially when we talk about the five sense realm. Uh, uh, very often the fun is in the pursuit, or very often when you have had that meal, uh, or you have enjoyed that entertainment, uh, and you're kind of satisfied. After a kind of a big meal or satisfied, you feel kind of empty. Yeah? It doesn't really, it's not really all that satisfying. A lot of the satisfaction is the getting to the meal. It's like tasting it and craving as you are eating. Yeah? Have you noticed very often when you eat a meal, it's like you're eating one spoon, uh, and you're all looking at the plate looking for the next one. Uh, 
Yeah, it's like you're never really satisfied, right? You're kind of always moving forward to something else. The satisfaction is never there. And so the kind of the, the actual achievement of the thing is not very important for us at all. The achievement is often quite empty. It is the pursuit of the goal that often is the meaning of life, especially in this five sense realm that we have, which is really a bit different from the spiritual realm. And so uh, uh, the idea of life, this idea of uh, always uh, kind of having instant gratification is actually a real, uh, is actually a real problem. Yeah? And what that means is that when we actually pursue all of these things, uh, it is actually the, uh, the craving is part of the fun, the craving is part of the purpose. Uh, in fact, if you start to look at what you identify as, as a person, uh, we identify a lot with the doing, with the craving, uh, with actually moving towards the goal. It's a very, very important part of what we take ourselves to be. Uh, and this, when we talk about the five khandas, for example, the five aspects of a person, if you can call it that, uh, one of the most important parts of that is the sankara khanda, yeah? the idea of uh, uh, the will, basically, is what that is all about. Uh, we identify with the will, and because we identify with the will, uh, we want to do the things that get us to the results. Uh, and so what all of this means in terms of patience, uh, it means that we should never really be too concerned about getting things too quickly, right? Uh, because actually that's not the meaning anyway. Uh, it's much better to be patient, uh, wait for things, to allow for things to come, uh, and put in the effort that actually gets us there. Uh, and then we will have some kind of sense of meaning in life. Uh, because the effort, the work, is actually the fun very often. That is actually the purpose and the point of all this. Uh, but that is in the five sense realm. Uh, and as uh, a spiritual practitioner, we really want to go beyond the five sense realm. Yeah? This is kind of part because, and the reason we want to do that is because the five sense realm is very often really not that satisfactory anyway. I'm just talking now about the idea of when you finally get your full and you finally are happy in the five senses. Actually, it feels kind of dull. It feels a bit depressing. Yeah? It is the work, the getting that is interesting. Actually, this, the joy and the happiness that comes from the five senses it often is very limited. Yeah? And uh, the Buddha has this beautiful simile of the dream. Do you, have you heard about the simile of the dream before? Huh? One person has heard, okay, you have not heard of the simile of the dream? Okay, okay, good, I'm glad. Okay. At least one person I can talk to, so that's, that's, really, that's really nice. So, so very often we have this idea, you know, the, especially in Hinduism, we have the idea that the whole world is, like, uh, is not really real. You know, the whole world is kind of like... Uh, um, it's like a superficial appearance of things, uh, but the reality behind appearance is actually something else. Uh, and it's often co compared to a dream, like that's the kind of the Hindu idea. In Buddhism, it's not quite like that, but in Buddhism, it's the five-sensed world that we consider a bit like a dream. And it's actually a very interesting idea. And this is the idea that when you have your kind of a vision about where you want to be, uh, yeah, where you want to go uh, in the world, uh, the reality never really lives up to the dream or to the vision that we want to get. Uh. And this is a very interesting point, uh, yeah, and I think it's very important. Uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, like, uh, you, you know, I, I just remember when I was young, I was at university, I was dreaming about, you know, what kind of job I was going to have and, and all, all these kind of things, yeah. I never dreamt of it being a monk, and now I'm a monk, I never even thought about that. But you have this dream about this job, this kind of girlfriend, this kind of relationship, uh, or everything is kind of set out, and you can, and this kind of really glossy kind of idea of the world. Uh, of course, the reality turns out to be very different. Uh, yeah? This is very different from what I was dreaming. Uh, yeah? Very, very different. Uh, no kind of, not, not the ordinary glossy kind of world at all. Uh, and this is always true of our reality. When you get that house of your dreams, actually, the house not as good as you thought it was. Yeah, it starts to fall apart as soon as you get it, uh, and it, there's always things going wrong with it, and then a burglar comes and burgles it. Uh, when you dream of your dream house, you never think about the burglar, right? Uh, never, I guarantee you. The burglar is completely out of your mind. Uh, but the reality is always far worse. Uh, when you get into your perfect relationship, actually, maybe it isn't as perfect as you thought it was. Uh, sometimes the relationships are downright disappointing, uh, because the people don't really live up to the standards of our minds. Uh, so there's a, there's a really big problem in the way we think about the world. It is not what we think it is. What we think it is is a made-up dream, and the reality is very, very different. And this is kind of the Buddhist idea of the dream. 
And my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, he had this very nice idea about how to kind of break through that delusion, the delusion of, of things uh, and how things are not as real as they are. Uh, and he said that you should always ask the question, and then what? That's a really good question. I don't know if you have seen the, you know, when you see a Western movie, right? At the end of the Western movie, the hero rides off into the sunset, yeah, and he's got the cowboy, has the cowgirl, and they kind of ride off, and they're happy ever after. That's kind of the idea you get, right? Uh, and as said, well, as soon as they ride off into the sunset, you should ask yourself, uh, what happens after they ride off in the sunset, right? Uh, they go back home, they have to wash the dishes, yeah, vacuum, actually maybe not vacuum because this is a cowboy movie, but whatever they did in those days, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> sweep the floor or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and then kind of maybe they have a little bit of an argument, right? And that is the reality of things. Uh, so always ask yourself, when you have a dream about the future, the dream house, the dream relationship. Always ask yourself the very important question, uh, and then what? Uh, what happens after that? Because the dream always stops at the point uh, where you acquire the thing of your dreams. Uh, yeah? It never really goes beyond that. Uh, and the and then what idea breaks the spell of the dream, uh, and suddenly you can see that reality in a very different way. Uh, and what that does, uh, it actually makes the sensory world slightly less interesting, uh, and what that does, it drives you on to the spiritual path. It makes the spiritual life far more interesting as a consequence. So first of all, we then realize that instant gratification is no, no good. So we go towards a more patient, patient life. And then the next step is to understand that even the patient life is not all that great if it is in the five sense realm. We need to bring patience into the spiritual realm. The real patience that really matters uh, is the, patient of the spirit, patience of the spiritual life. Uh, that is what is really important, uh, and that is what we want to talk about uh, today and any other time, I suppose. Uh, so uh, what does it mean, the patience in the spiritual realm, yeah, in the spiritual path? Uh, and one of those very beautiful little sayings that you find in the Dhammapada. Do you all know about the Dhammapada? Huh? Yeah? Huh? Yeah? Anyone does not know about the Dhammapada? Huh? You know about the Dhammapada? Don't know about the Dhammapada. Okay. You know about the Dhammapada? Don't know about the Dhammapada. Okay. Good. Don't know about it. Okay. Excellent. So, um, so Dhammapada is one of the very favorite Buddhist books. Yeah? It, it is a kind of a book full of verse, 400 and something verses uh, in this book. Uh, and it's the kind of book you have on your nightside table. Uh, and before you go to bed at night, instead of checking your phone, which many people do, you check out the Dhammapada instead. Yeah? You find a beautiful verse. Uh, and sometimes it's amazing. If you, if you have something very inspiring before you go to sleep, you sleep much better, yeah? Because you kind of, you, you feel a bit uplifted, you feel a bit better about yourself, and that kind of helps. And if you have a good night's sleep, wake up in the morning, feel more energized, and all these kind of things, uh, it's a very useful thing to do. Uh, so uh, that is what I recommend. And if you're going to, I was saying the other day that if you are going to have a mobile phone on your night time, on your kind of night, what is it called, bedside table, whatever it's called, uh, Make sure the only thing you use it for is to read verses in the Dhammapada. Yeah? So you have it connected to the internet, you go to the website and you read those verses. That's what a mobile phone really should be for. Everything else, check it out. <laughs> I'm, I'm being, uh, being naughty here. But anyway, so beautiful book. I really recommend people to read this because it's very inspiring, very uplifting. Sometimes the word of the Buddha can be a bit dry. Yeah, the prose can be a bit... Uh, boring perhaps, or dry, or technical, and it may not lift you up in the same way, but verses have a, a different effect and can be very, very powerful, just like verse in any language, really, I suppose. And uh, so one of these verses in the Dhammapada, the first line, it says, Kanti Padamang Tapo Titika. And uh, that means, and you're just going to have to take my word for it, unless you know Pali, yeah? Kanti is patience, Padamang means the highest, and tapo is asceticism, and titika is something similar to that. So kanti is the highest kind of asceticism. Yeah, it's what this is saying here. It's a beautiful saying. And of course, asceticism, tapo in this context, is really a shorthand for the spiritual life. The idea of living the spiritual life well. And so kanti, uh, patience, is the highest part of this. And that's kind of very interesting here. Yeah, so why is it that patience is the highest uh, ascetic quality uh, or quality of forbearance? Uh, how can that be? Uh? And uh, I think uh, uh, in, in many ways when people actually do ascetic practices, and India was very famous for all the ascetic practices, uh, you have the Jains yeah, who do all kind of crazy things, it's like standing on one leg for a year and 
sitting on a, on a super hot rock and burning themselves and doing all kind of mad stuff that was extremely painful. Uh, and of course, that kind of asceticism works the best when you are patient. You have, if you're not patient, it's going to be unbearable. Uh, so from the point of view of asceticism, uh, patience is actually what you are aiming for. So in that sense, it is kind of the, the highest kind of uh, uh, ascetic practice, if you like, tapo titika. Uh, that is one way of thinking about the idea of kanti yeah, and, and why it is the highest asceticism. Um, it is also, in, in, in another way, uh, yeah, if you're going to be an ascetic in Buddhism, Buddhism doesn't really believe in this idea of burning up your kamma or uh, practicing very severe tormenting of the body. It's not really part of the Buddhist path. Uh, so in the Buddhist path, kanti, uh, yeah, which is a kind of... Uh, can be painful, yeah, patience can be painful just like ascetic practice can be painful. It is much better to just have patience rather than all of these painful practices. So in that sense, it is also a kind of the highest thing here. Yeah. But um, to me, maybe the most important part of the idea why patience is so powerful is that tapo or asceticism, the way it is used in India, was used to burn up qualities that you wanted to get rid of so as to move forward on the spiritual path. And the Jain idea of the Jain ascetics was the idea of burning up your bad kamma, the bad karma. Because when you burn up your bad karma, eventually you eliminate all of that, and then that's how you gain liberation. Yeah? But in Buddhism, that is not the way the Buddha taught. We don't burn up our bad karma. In fact, we do the opposite. We create good karma, yeah? And when you create good karma by living well and doing all the right things, you kind of your bad karma sort of gets uh, dissipated and diluted by all the good karma that you're making here. So on the Buddhist path, we are burning up something else, uh, which is interesting here. Yeah? Yeah? And what are we burning up? There's one thing that doesn't like patience, uh, there's one thing that really hates patience, in which patience kind of counteracts. Uh, and that is the sense of self. Uh, yeah, because the sense of self wants to act in the world, as said before, that the idea of agency is a very important part of who we take ourselves to be. Uh, so the sense of self it ca is kind of counter to the idea of patience. Uh, so by being very patient and by allowing things to be, you're actually countering the sense of self. Yeah? So in a sense, we are burning up that sense of self uh, by being patient. Uh, so do, are you, do you want to burn up the sense of self or do you want to strengthen the sense of self? Uh? I don't know how much you know about the Buddhist teachings, uh, but from a Buddhist point of view, the sense of self is a real problem, right? It's like the ego in life. Uh, I'm sure you know that the ego can be really problematic sometimes. Uh, leads to conflicts, leads to all kinds of problems, leads to a sense of you know, conceit or all of these kind of things. Uh, so the ego can be very problematic. So as the, when the ego goes down a little bit, uh, actually it's a very beautiful thing that happens when that, ha when that occurs. Uh, have you ever had that idea of the ego kind of uh, lessening a little bit? Uh, yeah? So, <laughs> so one, one example of the ego going down uh, is when you do some meditation, right? Uh, you do some meditation, you become a little bit peaceful, uh, the thinking mind starts to die down. Uh, when the thinking mind dies down, actually there is less ego. Uh, because the thinking is usually produced by the ego. The ego wants to think because it wants to, I don't know, get angry with someone. What is it that gets angry? Well, it's the, it's the sense of self. What is it that desires things? Yeah, to amass things for itself. That is also, in many ways, the ego. So when, they, when you calm down the mind, the ego is less. And when you calm down the mind, yeah, what does it feel like? It feels pretty blooming nice, right? Yeah, that's what, I mean, when you become really still, you don't have all this thinking, this restlessness, agitation all the time. Actually, it feels very beautiful and very powerful. Uh, and so uh, when the ego goes down, uh, if you understand this idea correctly, it is not really scary. It's actually a very beautiful and very powerful experience. Uh, and so when you use patience uh, to counteract the sense of self, counteract the ego, actually doing something that is very beautiful and very powerful and actually leads a long way on the spiritual path uh, so, uh, so, but you have to kind of see this to be able to really believe it sometimes uh, because people are sometimes afraid of losing their sense of self. But actually, it feels quite nice. If you lose yourself in the wrong way, it feels bad. But if you do it in the right way, then it is very useful and very nice. Uh, so make sure you do it in the right way. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem. Uh. So this is 
a little bit about the idea of patience and why it is spiritually very powerful and very useful, uh, and how it kind of relates to the idea of non-self or the idea of an ego and all of these kind of things. Uh. So how do we do this in practice? Uh, yeah, what, what can we actually do on the spiritual path to um, engender this kind of process? Uh. And uh, one of the things I, just, I thought I would talk about just a little bit to start out uh, is what happens in the monastery, like I come from Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth. Uh, have you heard about this monastery? Uh, yeah, have you? Okay. Have you heard about Ajahn Brahm? Yeah? Okay. Has anyone not heard about Ajahn Brahm? Everyone heard about Ajahn Brahm? Okay. No, not Ajahn Brahm? Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. So it's better to ask if anyone has not heard of him because there's actually more people who have heard of him usually. So Ajahn Brahm, he is my teacher, Venerable Chandra's teacher, Venerable Pekka's teacher in Perth. He's actually British originally. Yeah? He comes from London. You have heard of him? Okay. I've heard of him. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. You're just kind of not connecting the dots. Yeah, that, that's fine. No, don't, don't worry. So, and he is very interesting how he runs our monastery, yeah, because that has this idea of patience about it, the way he does that. And it's very fascinating, yeah, because Ajahn Brahm never tells anyone off. Yeah, he never. He just allows things to kind of flow, right? And one of two things happen: either you can't deal with it, yeah, and, be, and you, it's kind of too difficult and uh, whatever, and it, you, you realize you weren't the right person for monastic life or whatever, and you leave the monastery, or you start taking responsibility for yourself. Uh. If you have a teacher who always kind of tells you what to do and you go this way and that way, it's almost as if it's difficult to take full responsibility for yourself because you expect the teacher to always tell you what to do. Uh. But with someone like Ajahn Brahm, you can't do that. Uh. Ajahn Brahm, you come to Ajahn Brahm and you complain about something, uh, he will just say, oh yeah, very good. Very good. Okay, carry on, carry on. And you, what? <laughs> and this is kind of Ajahn Brahm. Very good, carry on. It's kind of his mantra, right? And it's actually quite a nice mantra. Or, you, uh, or anything, whatever you say, he will normally say, just very good, carry on. And uh, if you say, oh yeah, this other monk behaved really badly. Yeah, or you, you, Ajahn, please say something to this other monk. Yeah, he's kind of lost the plot. Yeah, please bring him back into the fold again. Ajahn say, oh yeah, very good, carry on. And he will never say anything at all to this other monk. Yeah. <laughs> this is Ajahn Brahm for you. Huh? And uh, of course, there are situations where he would, because there are situations where it really is too bad, yeah, and it's kind of over the top. And of course, then he will take that responsibility because he is the leader of the community. Huh? But what happens after a while is that you start to realize you cannot rely on Ajahn Brahm to tell you off every time you do something wrong. He's not going to correct you. Huh? Yeah? What you have to do is look after yourself. You have to take responsibility for yourself. Yeah? You are the final decider on what is right and what is wrong. Yeah? Of course, you can ask Ajahn Brahm if you really have a deep question about Dhamma, about the Buddhist teachings, and you're uncertain about whether your conduct is right or wrong, you can go and say, Ajahn, please, please, out of compassion, please help me. And then he will help you. Yeah? He will guide you, of course. Yeah? But he will not guide you unbidden or because someone else is complaining about you. Yeah? And after a while, you start to take responsibility for yourself. And that is very empowering. Yeah? It means that you are responsible for your own life. No one else is really kind of uh, giving you specific, they give you general guidance, not specific guidance. And you use that general guidance as a way of deciding what you should be doing or not. And to me, this is one of the things that actually appealed to me from Buddha, with Buddhism from the very beginning. Yeah? Because I looked at all the theistic religions of the world, uh, and in the theistic religions of the world, it is always God who has the final responsibility. Uh, and I wasn't happy with that. Uh, I wasn't happy to give responsibility to some being that I didn't know anything about. Uh, I didn't know anything about this God. Is this God nice or not nice or neutral? Uh, who, are, who, who is this? Is it a she or he or it? Or what, what, what is going on there? Uh, and I was very kind of, I thought it was uh, scary to put my life into the hands of something I could not understand. Uh, and so I decided that Buddhist way is far better. Because in the Buddhist way, you are responsible for yourself. Yeah? If you, things go well for you, it is because of your self-responsibility. And if things go bad for you, well, then you can actually change and you can make things different. And that to me is a very beautiful, it's a very empowering. You are in charge of your life. You don't rely on some kind of unknowable external thing that is completely beyond your cognition or whatever. And so this is the same thing with Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm also is not God. Have you ever considered that before? 
Yeah. <laughs> Some people think, oh, Ajahn Brahm is like God. Yeah, okay. It's scary enough with kind of Venerable Peck and Ramachanda and myself, but if Ajahn Brahm comes out, it would be really, really scary. And some of these monks are much more scary than we are, right? We are kind of cute monks and nuns. Uh, <laughs> but some of these monks are not as cute as we are. They're kind of, whoa, very powerful. And they might read your mind, yeah, and these kind of things. So that's kind of really, really scary. So, uh, I think monastics should be a bit cuddly, right? Uh, not, I'm not suggesting anything, please don't cuddle. I'm, I'm just saying we should kind of, cuddling from a distance, right? Cuddling from a distance, that's what I'm saying, yeah. So, <laughs> so even though some people maybe think of Ajahn Brahm as kind of, well, Ajahn Brahm is like, he's going to read my mind, he's almost like God, or he can tell me exactly what to do, please don't think like that. Uh, because a good teacher does not usually give individual guidance like that. They give general guidance. Uh, then it's up to you to decide what is right and how you should be living your life. And that means, again, it comes back to this idea that Ajahn Brahm has to be very patient, right? Patience is the way he runs his, his monastery. He allows people to do, and if there is a problem, he just goes with the flow. Very, very patient with how he deals with things. Never really interfering, always allowing nature to take its course. And this is one of those critical things, why patience actually works. And this is, again, from the Buddhist idea that everything in Buddhism is causal. Everything relies on cause and conditions. Nothing stands on its own without cause and conditions. Yeah? So if that is the case, if you want to meditate, if you want to make spiritual progress, the reason why you make spiritual progress is because the causes and conditions have been put into place. And then the path progresses by itself according to nature. Yeah, Buddhism is really an idea of natural phenomena, how natural phenomena evolve. That's kind of the idea of Buddhism. It's all really about nature, about the nature of the mind, not kind of the physical world, of course, but it's still it's about nature, how natural phenomena evolve according to cause and conditions. And if things evolve according to cause and conditions, if things are according to an, a kind of the natural world, if you like, yeah, they are like an expansion of the the laws of physics or the kind of the usual laws of nature, but has the laws of the mind, if that is the case, uh, then doing something uh, to try to hasten the laws of nature uh, is not going to work, uh, right? If things happen according to causality, you have to allow that causal process to happen, giving it time to work out, uh, then things will happen as a consequence. Uh, so if your meditation isn't working, uh, it doesn't help to be impatient, Work, yeah, work faster. You, yeah, Buddha said they're supposed to work. It's not working. Buddha, yeah, is a fraud. I don't believe the Buddha anymore. Or whatever it is that you kind of think when you get really kind of frustrated with it. Everyone is frustrated with the meditation sometimes. So. And so you actually start to look instead at the causality in this process, yeah? How does the causality work? And you, uh, because it is according to natural phenomena, it is not according to how you make the process work, yeah? We try to want to make things work, and that is the problem. But once you understand that, once you understand that everything falls into place according to cause and conditions, according to how a natural process unfolds, you start to become patient. Because you cannot hasten this process anyway. The process will only happen if you put the cause and effects into place. So you put those into place, and then you're patient. Because if you're not patient, actually, we tend to destroy the natural process. So this is kind of the root idea of why patience matters so much. And if you understand this basic idea that everything happens according to laws of the mind or laws of nature, once you get that, yeah, and you understand this whole thing, yeah, actually, you withdraw. Yeah? You withdraw the kind of, um, kind of human tendency to always interfere, always put your fingers in there, trying to turn the the kind of the knobs or whatever, and make things happen, yeah? And you actually withdraw from that, and you allow the whole thing to happen as a consequence. So let me give you some examples of how this works. So one example, for example, is let's say that you decide, decide to practice the Buddhist Noble Eightfold Path, yeah? Which, of course, begins with the idea of morality, begins with the idea of being kind, avoiding bad things, acting badly towards other people. So one of the things that you recognize uh, is that you recognize that we all come with very powerful habits from the past. Uh, yeah? We come into this life, we have been brought up in a certain way with certain kind of parents. Uh, 
we've gone to school with certain kind of teachers. Uh, society has influenced us in a certain way. Maybe there are things from past lives. Uh, does anyone here have any sense, think past lives might be possible? Uh, is anyone who thinks past life is complete nonsense? Uh, no one thinks it's complete nonsense. Okay, good. We have a good, t good group here. So kind of have some kind of idea. This is, kind of, this is the Buddhist idea that there are kind of past lives. It's part of the Buddhist idea. And so your conditioning, your personality, your habits don't only come from this life, they also come from past lives. And because the past life is like an unfathomable depth, yeah? there's no kind of end to past lives. It means that our habits can be sometimes extremely strong, yeah? really, really powerful. Yeah? So if you try suddenly to be a completely nice guy, yeah? suddenly from now on today, I'm going to be super nice, I'm never going to say a bad thing, never do a bad action, never going to think a bad thought. If you say that to her, are you going to be able to do it? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm actually very, that's really cool that you actually thought about it for a second. I think that you must, so that you must already have a pretty good foundation, I reckon. Sorry, give it a go. He's going to give it a go. Okay. That's, that's really, that's really not, I'm sure if this is working anymore, but anyway, we'll do its best. Yeah. But usually if I, if I say to someone, yeah, for the next week, don't have a single thought of anger or even irritation, usually it's, it can't be done, right? Because there are irritating things happening around us all the time. And like I, what I like to say, everyone is irritating. Because we're all irritating, always irritating each other, actually it's very hard never to be irritated, at least a little bit, yeah? even on one single day. And that thought experiment, yeah? and you try, if you try it, you probably won't succeed, uh, is enough to show you how conditioned we are. We cannot actually guide our mind in such a way that we always think positive and good thoughts. It actually turns out to be impossible. That is because of the habits of the past. And that means that when we are, try, when we are on this path of trying to live better, trying to be more kind, less, have less ill will, treat people better, be all of these kind of things, it means that we are more patient with ourselves. We're more forgiving ourselves. We know at the outset that we're going to fail. And failure is okay. This is patience with yourself. And this is kind of the idea here. So when we set the bar very, very high to a very high degree of morality, uh, if you fail to clear that bar, which you will, uh, it's very easy to feel sad. Oh, I can't do it. I'm hopeless and these kind of things. Uh, but that would be really misunderstanding the Buddhist path. Uh, the idea is to set the bar high, try our very best to achieve kind of a very high standard of morality, but at the same time, be very forgiving of yourself, uh, understanding that you're never going to be fully successful with that. Uh, and this is kind of the idea of using patience, right? Uh, you have a high standard, at the same time you are forgiving. Uh, that means you never despair, you always try again. Uh, you know that the habits of the past, I like to use this simile of the super tank here, the habits from the past are this powerful momentum going forward. Uh, and because the momentum is so powerful, it takes a long, long, long time to turn that super tanker. I don't know if you've seen this super tanker, these enormous ships, half a kilometer long, weighing half a million tons or something like that, They're ridiculous, uh, ridiculously large uh, vessels. Uh, and they take kilometers to turn around, yeah? sometimes tens of kilometers. Uh, and we are like that. It takes a long time to turn around. Uh, so we need to recondition slowly, slowly, slowly. And eventually we start to get it. Uh, so be very patient with yourself. Be very caring. Look after yourself. And what you will find when you do that is that uh, if you get angry with yourself for not being able to live up to your own standards, uh, you're actually blocking your ability to learn from your mistakes. Uh, because the anger is a reaction that does not allow you to watch very carefully what is going on. Uh, the moment you get angry, you are, your learning curve goes down. Uh, but if you are patient with yourself instead, you stand back and you watch, and you see, oh, I'm getting angry. Okay, that's all right, yeah, it's not no big deal. And then you watch, and then you learn why you're getting angry. You can see what's going on. Okay, this person was irritating. Okay, why were they irritating? Are they really irritating, or is it just my perception? What kind of qualities do they actually have? Maybe they have some good qualities I can focus on instead, right? And you understand the causality of what is going on. Then you can change it. So patience is actually a very important part to enable change. It enables us to stand back, to watch carefully what is going on, understand the causality that is inherent in all our actions, 
and then change our habits, change our view, change the way we think, because we understand what is going on here. Am I making any sense to anyone? Yeah? Okay, good. I, I always feel that I'm making sense to myself. I'm always making sense to myself, right? But I, I better check with the audience as well. So, good. I'm glad. So, um, so that is like the initial thing, right? To, start to have patience with the way we act and the way we, we do things. And uh, you can also bring this into the idea of uh, not just how we are towards ourselves, but also how we are towards other people as well, how we look at other people. And uh, one of the things I really recommend you to do is start to uh, look at people in a new way. One of the biggest problems in life, one of the things that Buddha said we should always try to deal with is ill will and anger, because it's so destructive. Yeah? It destroys our personal, interpersonal relationships. Uh, it uh, creates wars in the world. It creates all of these kind of terrible things, all this ill will that we have. Uh, so if we can reduce ill will at least a little bit, uh, yeah, what a wonderful thing that would be for society, for ourselves personally, for everything really. Uh. So how can we do that? Well, first thing is to understand that ill will or anger almost always has to do with other people, right? Uh, other people are the most irritating thing in the world. Uh. What did... Uh, there was a famous, what was that again? I think it was Ajahn Brahm who told me this. I get everything I know from Ajahn Brahm. And he, what did he say again? Um, I, uh, there was something about, uh, the, yeah, I think the biggest problem in the world is other people, or something to that effect. Uh, yeah, that's what he, I think he said. I think it was one of the, anyway, it was some kind of philosopher. And, um, and that is true. Yeah? So people are both the things that are closest to us, that mean the most to us, and they're also the biggest problem in our life. It's kind of this very two-edged sword, uh, sword in a sense. Uh, and so how can we learn to look at people in the way so that we have more understanding, more compassion, more time? We don't react so quickly. We don't get irritated and angry so easily. Uh, and one of the ways of doing that is to remember that just like you are conditioned, uh, they too are conditioned, yeah? And the conditioning runs incredibly deep. And if you are faced with someone and they are behaving badly towards you, actually, it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the other person. It is their conditioning that happens to come out in your presence. It may feel like they are attacking you. It may feel like they're saying bad things to you. But it's not really about you at all. It's just about you being present when these things come out in them. If someone like you had been exactly in that position, they too would have, been, have, have to bear the brunt of that uh, negative qualities in that person. Uh, so you depersonalize it. Uh, yeah? It is the other person who has a problem. You don't actually have a problem at all. Uh, you just watch them. Oh, yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah? You, you don't, don't say those things, just think those things. Yeah? Otherwise, you get into serious trouble. Uh, uh, and, and you just you realize that actually their conditioning is what is coming out. And this is another aspect of this idea, Buddhist idea of non-self. People don't act out of a sense of self because I want to be nasty towards you. I want to be nasty towards Ajahn Brahmali. Ajahn Brahmali is a bad monk. I'm going to do bad things. I'm going to tell him off or whatever. Something like that. Yeah? Um, and it's not because of... Uh, it's not because of a sense of self that they decide that. It's because of cause and conditions. Coming together at that time, and then they can't stop themselves. These things come out of them, whether they want to or not. And I'm sure you have often seen that in your own life. Sometimes things come out of you. You may say things or do things that you'd rather not say or do. But the power of the conditioning is so strong at that time, actually, you can't stop it. And other people who have less kind of spiritual inclination than you have, uh, they may not have no awareness at all of what is going on. It just comes out of them. Uh. And what you can do then at that particular point, uh, because you are now being patient with them, uh, you understand that there is a problem, yeah? what you can do at that point is actually have compassion for them. Uh, because they are conditioned in the way that they do bad things. Uh, and if they do bad things, it is not the other person who has to... Uh, face most of the consequences, it's they themselves who have to face most of the consequences of their bad actions. Because if you live a life of a lot of badness, you tend to feel bad about yourself. You lose your sense of self-worth. And of course, from a Buddhist point of view, down your track, if you get reborn or whatever, you have lots of bad qualities, it's going to have terrible consequences. So the moment you realize that, first of all, you get patient with the other person because you understand, actually, it's nothing to do with me. They are the one who have a problem. You get patient. And then 
you turn that patience into compassion afterwards because you understand they have a problem there. They are heading in the wrong direction. They are like a sick person, said the Buddha, or it says in the Buddhist suttas. Someone who is acting badly a lot is like a sick person. It's a very beautiful way of thinking about it, yeah? Because the moment you see that, they are sick because they are deluded, because they are walking in darkness, because they have no idea what they are doing. Yeah? The moment you see that, you have compassion for them, just like you have compassion for a sick person in real life. So this is how patience, again, allows you to stand back, allows you to see people in a new light. So first of all, we use the patience I've been saying now to be more moral and to change the direction of our super tank. Then we use patience, how to deal with people and to reduce our reaction towards others, have more time for others, not get angry so easily. But the last and the most powerful way of using patience is in your meditation practice. And uh, this is something that I say whenever I teach a meditation retreat. Uh, I say this in almost every talk I give. Yeah? So uh, if you have heard this before, it's probably because you have heard it before. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And uh, uh, what this uh, beautiful discourse by the Buddha, uh, he talks about the process of meditation, uh, what it feels like from a first-person perspective. Yeah? What does meditation actually feel like? Uh, and he goes through a long process uh, and he shows, stage by stage, how it evolves mentally, what it feels like to meditate. Yeah? And he starts off by saying at the very beginning of this process is sila. Sila is a Pali word for morality or ethics or kindness, these kind of things. And from that sila comes a sense of non-regret. Yeah? Non-regret means that your mind is bright, your mind is clear because you don't have any darkness in there which kind of drags you down. That non-regret leads to what is called pamuja in Pali. Yeah, okay, I'll translate it for you. Pamuja means uh, like joy, yeah? And that joy then, when you keep carrying on your meditation, you're watching the breath or whatever, leads to what is called piti. Piti is like, considered like rapture. Rapture is often kind of a, a physically felt pleasure. And it's got, now it's already beginning very, very pleasurable. Then from that piti comes pasadi, which is a deep sense of tranquility in your meditation. Uh, a deep sense of tranquility leads to an even more powerful sense of happiness called sukkha in Pali. And that sukkha, because the pleasure is so incredibly powerful, leads to the complete stillness of the mind, which is known as samadhi in the Pali language. Yeah? That is the process of meditation in the suttas. Isn't that extraordinary? If you look back on the terms I was just mentioning, right? It starts off with virtue. Okay, virtue, maybe okay, not so interesting. Okay, non-regret, okay, that's, that's better, right? Already kind of on the right track. Then joy, okay, now we're getting into business, right? Then rapture, rapture is even more joy than joy. It's like a kind of physically felt rapture in the body or in, in the mind as well. Now it's getting really, really good. Huh? Then tranquility, huh? So based on that rapture, you go even further down to a very sense, very deep sense of peace and tranquility in the mind. From that deep sense of tranquility in the mind, you get an even higher kind of happiness, sukkha. From that higher kind of happiness comes this complete stillness of the mind called samadhi. That is the process of meditation for you in brief. It can be expanded out a lot as it is in the Anapanasadi Sutta, the Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing. But that is what meditation is about. Isn't that extraordinarily attractive? All about happiness, all about peace, all about tranquility, all the way. And what does that lead to, all of that tranquility and happiness? It leads to what is called yata bhuta nanadasana in Pali, which means knowledge and vision according to reality. So it leads to insight, it leads to understanding, it leads to the uncovering of the nature of the mind and the nature of uh, who we are, basically, as human beings. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, so the process of meditation, which is so beautiful and has so many beautiful aspects to it, also leads to the most powerful insights we can possibly have on the Buddhist path. Yeah? Everything coming together. Yeah? Now, I, I don't know, when I read suttas like this, I thought, wow, I'm going to be a Buddhist. Yeah? You can't hold me away from Buddhism. This is exactly what I want. Yeah? This is so powerful. And who doesn't want happiness? I mean, everyone wants happiness in their life. Is that true? Yeah? Is anyone here who would rather not have too much happiness? <laughs> everyone wants happiness. No one wants more problems. No one wants more suffering. No one wants to br break a leg every all the time, right? Uh, 
because it's painful to break a leg. We want to have less suffering, we want to have more happiness. Uh, and so when you read things like this, uh, and you understand that the happiness that is described here is not just ordinary happiness, it is actually very, very profound. Yeah? It is a happiness that people like the Buddha would have, uh, like the great meditation mass in the world would have. Uh, we are so still. When you see a person like that in meditation, uh, they are so still. Uh, you wonder whether they have died. Have you ever seen that before? Someone meditating so still that it looks like they have died? There's a nice story about that. And this is kind of, again, one of these meditation stories. And uh, uh, it just comes to mind now as I'm talking about this. But it's a nice story. And this was a story from Thailand. I can't remember exactly where I heard it. And this was in the early days when Ajahn Brahm himself was a young monk. So this must have been maybe 35, no, four, maybe more, like 40 40 years ago, maybe 45 years ago. And in Thailand in those days, in the International Forest Meditation Monastery, they would have all-night sits, uh, sit meditation all night. Yeah? And they, so they go from uh, uh, maybe starting at about, uh, I don't know, what, sometime in the 7 in the evening, and then go till the next morning. And next morning they would just go straight out on arms around afterwards. Uh. And during those meditation sits, very often most people can't really make it. Yeah? It's too arduous to do that sitting all night. Uh. And so the monks are there, and then all the lay people, these are the lay people from the Thai villages, yeah? And these people in the Thai village have been sitting on the floor all their lives, uh, and they know how to sit cross-legged, and they can sit cross-legged for, probably for days, but at least for hours, without any kind of problem. And many of these were kind of ancient, the ancient Thai ladies, yeah, who come to the temple all the time to listen to the Dhamma and take part in these things. Uh. And uh, so they would sit there on one of these nights, yeah, and as the night was going on, more and more monks would leave, more and more lay people would leave, and at a certain point during the night, there was only two people left in that hall, in that meditation hall. One of them was Ajahn Brahm, he was sitting on a high seat, the monks always sit on the high seat, and one of them was one of these ancient Thai ladies, yeah, who could sit forever on the floor, yeah. and she would observe Ajahn Brahm, and she would observe Ajahn Brahm, and after a while, she realized that he hasn't moved at all for the last two hours. No movement. He looks like a rock. When a human being looks like a rock, something must be wrong, right? So she keeps on observing him. And when she is absolutely sure of her case, she leaves the hall, she goes out, and she gets hold of another monk and says, there's a dead monk in the hall, please go and check it out. Yeah? <laughs> That's kind of a cool story, because of course Ajahn Brahm wasn't dead, unless he has kind of reincarnated and come back, but he, he, I, yeah, he's still here. So the idea is that when you go into deep samadhi, it is so profound, it is so deep, the bliss is so utterly encompassing here, that you don't move at all for hours upon hours upon hours. You look like you are dead, basically. There's another story about that which I won't tell now, because time is getting shorter. But there's another story about the monk who was burned on the funeral pyre, yeah, because they thought he was dead. And so he, they, they kind of put this big kind of funeral pyre, and they lit it all, and then they went away. And the next morning, that same monk came for Pindabat, for arms around, right? He came for arms around. But we burnt you yesterday on the funeral pyre. Yeah, what's going on here? And this is because the samadhi was so profound, like according to the sutta, the fire can't even touch you. That's the story anyway. I'm just telling you the story. I'm not sure what exactly happened there. So um, the idea anyway here is that uh, meditation at this level is extremely interesting. Yeah? You're starting to find the meaning of life itself. Uh, and this is the promise of the Buddha, that actually you are discovering the meaning of life itself when you practice these things. Uh, because the stillness, uh, the sense of purpose, the sense of having no more craving, no more urge to go anywhere, basically means that you're discovering the meaning of life. Uh, so if you want to discover the meaning of life, uh, practice Buddhism. If you don't want to discover it, uh, you can do something else. So that's really entirely up to you. But I really recommend the meaning of life uh, discoveries. Pretty, pretty useful to know the meaning of life, you know? Because then you have a sense of direction. Yeah, you know what to do with your life. Uh. But what my point here is, because this talk is about patience. So, so my point here is that uh, how you move between these various stages in meditation is actually very interesting. Uh. Because you move then from non-regret to pamudja, to, to joy. You move from joy to rapture. You go from rapture to tranquility. Yeah? How is it that you move between these stages? And the Buddha says something very interesting in this context. 
He says that this is not to be done by an act of intention or by an act of will. Yeah? So in other words, this whole process does not happen because you make it happen, right? Uh, intention and will is actually a mistake in this case. Uh, so the Buddha then says it is a dhammata that you go from one stage to the next one. Dhammata means it is in accordance with nature. Uh, and this is what I said before. Everything in Buddhism, all of these things we do, is always in accordance with nature. Uh, so if you want nature to take uh, its course, uh, yeah, you cannot really make nature happen by using willpower. If you try to use willpower on nature, you have a problem. Uh. And the simile that I always hear that Ajahn Brahm always tells, and which is a nice simile, is like you have a, a little child, right? And the mother takes the little child and says, okay, I'm going to show you how to grow plants. So they give the child a little a sunflower seed or something, and the mom says, okay, put that sunflower seed into the ground, yeah, and then you water it, a little bit of water every day, not too much water, not too little, otherwise it might dry out or it might drown, and then you see what happens. And after a few days, the child does what his mom has said, it starts to sprout, yeah, and the child gets really excited, mommy, mommy, it's coming out of the ground, yeah, look at this, and there's a little thing coming out of the ground. But then after another couple of days, it is growing so slowly, from the child, right? It's, it's not happening. So the child decides, I'm going to help nature a little bit. Uh, yeah? So it grabs hold of the little sprout, starts pulling it. Uh, yeah? And that is a very, very bad idea when you're dealing with a little plant. Uh, if you pull a little plant, uh, you're going to destroy the little plant. Uh, and this is the idea of using willpower on nature. Uh, if you use willpower on nature, you're going to destroy the natural process itself. Uh, so what do we need to do? Uh, we need to stand back, and we need to allow nature to take its course. That is really the only way nature can happen. And of course, to be able to stand back and allow nature to take its course, you have to be patient. Yeah? You have to really understand that this is actually what is going on. And so the whole process of meditation is the ability to stand back and allow things to grow according to its own cause and conditions. And then you're going to be able to do this meditation properly. Yeah? Patience is ultimately what this is all about. Standing back, cause and effect taking root. And when cause and effect really take, uh, are strong enough, the process will happen by itself. And you will have noticed when I talked about this process, I said that it starts out with sila. Sila being virtue, morality and kindness. So if the process is not working fast enough, what you have to do is you have to work harder on your morality, on your kindness. That is what makes this whole thing happen. Then it starts to come out as a consequence. So this is, uh, in brief, yeah, the idea of how patience can be a superpower on our path. Instead of uh, trying to make things happen, using willpower, causing nature to happen in a faster way than nature actually can happen, uh, what we should always do in Buddhism, we should always stand back and ask about causes and conditions. And the moment you stop to interfere, you actually have more ability to observe properly. And when you observe properly, you can see how the causality, the nexus of causality works. Yeah? You can see when I do this, it leads to bad consequences. When I do that, it leads to good consequences. And then you start to uh, get an understanding of how the process of spiritual growth actually happens. Uh, and then when you do that, what you do is that you fortify those causes and conditions that give rise to spiritual growth, uh, and you try to eliminate those causes and conditions that reduce spiritual growth. Uh, and you become wise about the path rather than using willpower. Uh, and this is one of the beautiful teachings that I always got from Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm always said, use wisdom power, don't use willpower. It is wisdom power that gets you somewhere on the spiritual path, not willpower. So you stand back, observe, you learn about causality, you learn about conditionality, and as you learn that, then you enable this whole path to happen in this way. And this is really how the Buddhist path works. And to be able to do that, the one thing that you really need is patience. And if you understand the nature of causality, you will be patient because you will actually figure out that driving the process through willpower is never going to work. So learn to think like this, yeah? And gradually, gradually, as you do this, you're taking the sense of self out of the equation, yeah? Taking this idea that I am going to do this, you leave that to one side, and you're also undermining the sense of self at the same time. 
And of course, ultimately, on the spiritual path, it is, uh, in a Buddhist, from a Buddhist perspective, the idea is to eliminate the sense of self entirely, because the sense of self is the root problem there. And now you can start to see a little bit why the sense of self is so problematic, yeah? Because the sense of self wants to do nature. Instead of allowing nature to happen, it interferes in natural processes. And when it interferes in natural processes, it destroys the ability of those processes actually to happen on their own accord. And that is why it is so problematic. So if we can undermine that a little bit, great. Then you're going to be on the right track. So I have probably talked too much already. So I'm going to stop there. So uh, uh, usually I like to give people a chance to comment or to ask questions or whatever you like. So, uh, because uh, some of these things can maybe be a bit challenging, and I don't know if all of you are. I forgot to ask at the beginning whether you are beginners or kind of old practitioners or whatever, but now it's too late, so whatever happened, happened. Uh, so. <laughs> but uh, please feel free to uh, ask any questions or comment or whatever you would like to do at this uh, particular point. Anyone would like to say anything? Yeah, please. Yeah. Some objects are afraid that you will also do one's experience. When you think about sense of self and ego, are you speaking about psychiatry or asimana or something else? I'm talking about uh, uh, both of those. Uh, and uh, so Sakaya is, uh, uh, is the view that uh, is called like, uh, sometimes called personality view or identity view or something like that. Uh, and it's this idea that there is some sort of um, um, uh, inherent essence to a human being. It's this, this, this view that there is something, that me is real somehow, I am real somehow. That is the idea of Sakaya Ditti. Uh, and once you have that view, then the ego emerges from that, and it takes various forms. Yeah? You identify with something, you are somebody, and it comes from the Sakaya Ditti. Uh, Asmimana is the, uh, the conceit, I am, uh, yeah? and it's a, it's a more profound thing. Uh, and that is what, uh, even if you uh, understand or you see through Sakaya Ditti, Asmimana is still there until you, until you reach full awakening. Uh, and so that is also always present, yeah? the conceit, I am, but the conceit I am has a consequence, and one of the consequences of the conceit I am, once you say I am, that I am has to have certain uh, uh, properties to it. It cannot exist without properties. So once you have a feeling I am, you have to take uh, certain parts of yourself uh, to be that I am. Yeah? It, I am cannot exist on its own without actually having properties. And those properties of the sense of self will be taken from the five khandhas, the five personality aspects. So you will say, I am this feeling, I am the will, I am the consciousness, I am the body. And then because you are these things, and because the world affects your mind, that sense of self also goes into the world. Yeah, and that is why we have ownership in the world, because we want to control the world. Because when we control the world, we also control our feelings. Yeah? If you have a nice home, you control the sense that you feel safe at night. You have a nice bed to sleep and you have entertainment. You have a nice food, a nice kitchen. You can kind of make, mix up a nice meal or whatever. Yeah, this is kind of the purpose of a home, to have a place where you feel safe and uh, where you can kind of enjoy yourself. Uh, so the sense of self leads into the world, and that's why we attach in the world. Uh, and the moment you have a sense of self, all of these things take place. The cravings, the attachments, the uh, uh, kind of the, uh, uh, the uh, yeah, all of the problems arise actually from that in this way. Yeah. So I'm talking about everything, all of that, uh, and probably more as well, but uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a good starting point, yeah. Okay, so uh, please, you don't have to ask really fancy questions like that one, you know, you can very welcome to ask really simple, very simple questions. Uh, so, uh, please don't feel shy. I promise not to bite or to be nasty if you ask something. <laughs> please, yeah. Uh, um, when I come back from retreat, I've, I can see myself that my levels of patience are a lot more higher. And when I throw back into my normal life, like young children and work and things like that, I can feel my patience getting a lot lower. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that in amongst the responsibilities and normality of life out there, well-being is limited, there are limits to well-being? 
Um, I think I think it is more it is difficult, yeah. And I certainly I know what you mean by being on retreat versus uh, kind of live, you know, being in your ordinary job and these things. I'm, there certainly is a difference there, and you should never really expect to have that level of uh, patience in your ordinary life. I think that would be asking for too much. Uh, uh, but what you um, can do is that you can, uh, you know, the, the main thing in life, if you really want to have success in a meditation, is coming back to morality and sila and kindness and these kind of things. Uh, so the main thing in daily life is to ensure that you are kind. Yeah? That is really what, what you really want to do. Huh? And uh, so the most important thing sometimes is just to kind of program this into your mind so deeply yeah? and to understand this is so important uh, that even if you lose your patience, okay, you stand back. You know I'm losing my patience now. Okay, let me disappear for a while. Let me make myself scarce because this is kind of... This is scary. I'm about to say something wrong. So maybe you lock yourself in a toilet cubicle or something like that just to get away because there are people around or whatever it is. Uh, so, but you take the idea of morality so seriously that even if you do lose your patience more easily, uh, you're still able to restrain yourself. You're still able to hold back uh, because you know how important it is. Uh, yeah? So, uh, I, so uh, yeah. So I think that there is no way that we're going to be able to... Uh, you know, sustain the same level of mindfulness, the same level of patience or whatever in ordinary life. Uh, but you can still do things that uh, ensure that you, uh, you, know, you live in a good way so as not to destroy your uh, ability to come back to meditation again later on. Because uh, if you end up doing, saying many bad things and try to meditate, the meditation is going to be messed up. Uh, and then that kind of destroys the whole purpose of the spiritual path in a sense. Uh, yeah. Uh, probably not a very helpful answer, but I'm afraid that's, you know, sometimes... <laughs> yeah. Good, uh, yeah, great. Uh. So, yeah, please. Um, can, I, can I ask a question about the, the past meditation? You can ask about any question oh, you want. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, because um, I was on the retreat, <laughs> and I, I noticed that I was having difficulty with my mind, and I was having difficulty Vipassana meditation and samadhi. Oh, the samadhi meditation, yeah. yeah. So the there's the whole breathing meditation kind of contains all all of all of the watching things arise and pass away and achieving calmness and potentially going into jhanas mm. and the. Awakening thing, or that is related to, is not necessary to go into jhanas, or, or <laughs> I just yeah yeah. No, yeah. so I I would say don't worry about that. You know whether whether you need jhanas to awake have awakening or not, because it's it's kind of. Uh, it becomes a very theoretical thing. The, the most important thing is you practice the Noble Eightfold Path, and you never stop that path. You don't say, yeah, jhana is not worse, I'm going to stop now, I'm not going to go any further. That would be crazy, right? That's a kind of silly idea. You just practice the path as far as you can. And if you get to the doorstep of the jhana and you can attain them, of course you attain them, because they're part of the path. But if you can't attain them, well, then the question is redundant anyway. So either way, it's redundant. <laughs> But so just, uh, you know, I, I, it's kind of a, a theoretical thing. I think people want to know this because they want, they want to know that I can't attain them and I can still achieve awakening. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that people want to know, reason why they ask these kind of questions. Yeah. Uh, but uh, again, just come back to the practice. So the practice, we know what the practice is. Uh, we know what the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path are. Uh, so you practice those however far that takes you. At some point during that path, you will achieve some kind of insight, which is equivalent to awakening or whatever. It doesn't matter where it is. Uh, you just carry on, and this will happen as a as part of the course uh, as you do this. Uh, and that is really, I think, the right kind of attitude to have. Uh. So when you do mindfulness of breathing, uh, that process, uh, you know, at any point, the deeper you go, the more powerful will be your ability to have insight at the end of that meditation. So if you go, if you get to kind of the blissful breath, uh, you will have some idea of uh, uh, looking back on that blissful breath. You will see the process of meditation. You will understand it in a certain way. The painful feelings have disappeared. The body has largely disappeared. So you start to have some understanding of impermanence and these kind of things through seeing the changing of things. Uh, the deeper the process go, the more ability you have to understand impermanence and suffering and non-self because it's just bleeding obvious when things kind of fade away and disappear, right? You can't really avoid it anymore. Uh, and so, uh, and if, when you get to the, 
The reason why the jhanas are so powerful is because so much has disappeared. So much has faded away. Almost the whole world is gone. All that is left is this very, very powerful bliss. And so that enables you. First of all, the mind is very powerful. And because so much has happened, so much, there's so much data there, right? That you can't really miss it anymore and you see what's going on there. So just practice like this, yeah? And then see. And then you will see. It will, at some point, you will have the results that you want to. So, so it's more yeah. about the process, the being with and enjoying the process. Yeah, yeah. Enjoying the process and using whatever you have in the process to gain a little bit of insight. And then that little bit of insight will help you to get more samadhi, more stillness. More stillness will get more insight and they kind of they work together in this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> okay. Please, yeah. Uh, I don't know what you have explained right now. Is this just a view to hold in the background? Is, is this what it is? Or, or should I be asking myself is the Rupa of that regularly? Is it Rupa there? Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, it's more like, no, you just do that when you, do, when you meditate, yeah? When you go into meditation, especially when you have a successful meditation. Uh, because what you will see is that, well, what is it that we experience during meditation? Well, what we experience is the five khandas, the five aggregates, yeah? the five aspects of personality. That is what we are experiencing. Yeah? So when you are going through a process, uh, you're actually seeing a change in the five aggregates. Uh, the deeper the meditation is, uh, the more of these aggregates actually fade away. And sometimes it ceases completely. Uh, and so when you come out of your meditation afterwards, you cannot help but seeing what's happening. Yeah? If the body was completely gone for an hour, wow, the body was gone for an hour. You, know, you can't help seeing that. And that's kind of the, uh, what's going on there. So you use that process of meditation to gain insight into these five khandhas, the five aggregates, sir, because that is what that process is. It is a particular evolution of those aggregates in the... Uh, in, a, in a sense, they become less and less and less. It's called the viraga in Pali. It means like uh, fading away. And then eventually they cease altogether. Uh, and the more they fade away, the more they cease, uh, the more insight you get into them. Uh. So there's something you use for meditation. In daily life, it is not powerful enough. You can't really do very much. Yeah? It's like, it uh, becomes like Mickey Mouse. Uh, doesn't, not even Mickey Mouse, actually. Mickey Mouse probably tell me off if I said that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't really work in daily life. It's just too... Uh, uh, the mind is not powerful enough. You don't see enough. All you see is a very superficial kind of change. And that superficial change doesn't really have much uh, uh, effect on your ability to understand the world, if you like. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, good. Please, um, I at some point you said something about this losing your sense of self in good ways, and then you also mentioned losing your sense of self in bad ways. I think. Yeah. And I was just wondering yeah. exactly what you meant well, what, by that. Right, and yeah. Way, and that's a good point, and I think it is an important point. Actually. But there, there are, you know, if you are mentally unstable, for example, you can actually lose your sense of identity and sense of self in kind of psychologically bad ways. And uh, sometimes you get people who are in psychological difficulties coming to Buddhist retreats and Buddhist meditation because they want to sort themselves out. So fair enough. You know, how can you blame them? Uh, but that is very important that you get good instructions. Uh, because if you don't get good instructions, you can have very bad negative psychological consequences. Uh, so make sure that you are okay. Make sure that you don't keep confused and deluded in your meditation. Things heading in the wrong direction. Uh, uh, because there are things like... Uh, you know, um, depersonalization, the kind of very severe psychological things that can happen if you take these things too far. Yeah. So that is what I meant by that. So you have to make sure that it feels, if it feels nice, if it is joyful, if it is peaceful, then it is a good kind of ego reduction. If it feels unstable and bad and dodgy, then it's a bad kind of, uh, of uh, reduction of the ego. Yeah. I have a feeling we probably have to... Uh, uh, come towards uh, the end. We're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, about the Anukampa project towards the end. Uh, so, uh, one more question? Yeah, you sure? Okay. One more question says, yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, the slave here, so I just do whatever the, the boss, because she, she has invited me, so I'm very happy to do whatever is, uh, is required. Please, uh, yeah. You, you talk about how um, uh, intention and volition can, can get in the way of the, um, the practice. Mm. Um, but one of the um, 
I, I know I know in a lot of the sutras there's there's a real talk about kind of uh, the effort uh, required and yeah. and, and uh, how striving is quite a big part of uh, the part for some people. How how do those two fit? Zell, uh, yeah, right. Well, but, I mean, I think the interesting thing, and this is kind of what you see in the suit as in many places, the Buddha talks about getting rid of, overcoming, obliterating bad qualities. Uh, and when it says obliterating, it sounds like they take out the sledgehammer yeah, and really kind of whack it to smithereens. That's what it sounds like. Uh, but then you start to read it broadly in the sutta, as you start to recognize that actually the only way to really uh, get rid of something is actually through wisdom. Uh, if you use willpower to get rid of something, you tend to kind of push it aside into a corner of the mind, uh, and then it comes back with a vengeance later on, as soon as you let go of that willpower. Uh, but if you want to overcome something, if you see something as problematic, if you see something as suffering, uh, and you see it with wisdom, uh, actually the mind lets go like that. Uh, and that is the idea of using wisdom power. Uh. So when we talk about right effort, the best way to have right effort is to kind of understand things, yeah? use wisdom, uh, and use that to kind of overcome things. Occasionally, you may have to use a bit of willpower. Yeah? I'm not saying it is always wrong, but 95% of the time it's probably wrong. Yeah? Yeah? So use wisdom, and then in when it comes to actual, so that is kind of in ordinary life to kind of live in a good way. But then it comes to the meditation practice, yeah? and that is where really the right effort can be called patience. Right? So the idea is that if your mind is kind of running around, or you're thinking about all kinds of things, or maybe you're getting really tired and lethargic or whatever, then it is using the mind in such a way as to let go of those problems. That is right effort. Yeah? So you want to get rid of the thinking mind. How do you do that? Well, by being content, yeah? by understanding the nonsense, nonsensicality, or whatever the word is, of those thoughts, yeah? of how uninteresting they are how there is a greater happiness to be had by uh, focusing on the breath, for example, all of these kind of things. So very often, patience, uh, or uh, again, wisdom power is a path, also in meditation, rather than using a lot of effort. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do I want? I'm sure if want is right, whatever I'll say, I'll do it anyway. <laughs> of course I'll say something. I'm very happy to do that. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, uh, nice, to, <laughs> nice to be here in Bristol. Uh, I can't remember whether I've been in Bristol before. Actually, maybe I have in my life. I can't remember. I think maybe I have a long time ago, but it's kind of faded from memory. But uh, uh, it's always nice to travel around and to meet other people on the same kind of spiritual path. Uh, so it's really nice to be here. And I'm always very happy to come and teach if uh, it is helpful. So it's great to have this opportunity here. Uh, but uh, the main reason I'm here is because I was invited by Venerable Chanda, yeah? and, so, and she invited me because she is starting her Anukampa Bhikkhuni project, uh, which is kind of uh, building up a community of nuns uh, yeah, here in the UK. Uh, and uh, what she's doing, which is kind of really unique, uh, she's building up a real nuns community. Uh, and uh, this is one of those interesting things in Theravada Buddhism, uh, that the nuns' community had really disappeared for about a thousand years. Uh, and over the last few decades, it's gradually starting to be built up again around the world. Uh, we have quite a strong uh, community of nuns in Australia. Venable Pekka here, she is, she is uh, from our, our monastery, quite large monastery in Australia. Uh, but Venable Chanda is trying to establish a similar presence here in the UK. Uh, and what she is really doing, uh, she is building up one of the four assemblies that has gone missing from Buddhism. Buddhism really is based on the idea of four assemblies, the monks, the nuns, the lay women, and the lay men. These are the four assemblies. And without all four, there is an imbalance in Buddhism. Yeah? Buddhism isn't really complete in a sense. So it's a wonderful thing that she is taking on the pioneering work of trying to re-establish basically a complete Buddhism right here in the UK. And what a wonderful thing that is. And uh, so I, my job is to kind of uh, assist a tiny little bit, do my little bit to kind of help out with that. Uh, she is the one who has to do the vast majority of the work, and it's really, really difficult. It's always difficult to be a pioneer. Uh, you have to do things that no one has ever done before. You don't really know what's going to happen next. Uh, and uh, it's very, very challenging. Yeah. And uh, so my job now is just to encourage you to, if you have the opportunity, to support her in whatever way you can, to encourage you to do that, because I think it is a very important and very 
powerful and significant thing for the whole of Buddhism that she is doing. And it's a wonderful chance to kind of be able to assist that. And uh, yeah, so that's really all I would like to say. So would you like to add anything? Yeah. Thank you for that. And thank you for the wonderful talk. It's always a delight to hear you give Dhamma talks. And I've been blessed with that. We've both been blessed with that. And many of you as well for the last two weeks. So I would say that your contribution is not a little. It's quite a lot, and um, a big part of our project actually is to um, have uh, the opportunity for women to take full ordination. But it isn't just for our sakes, it's not just for the sake of any woman who wants to train. Of course, this is wonderful because we want to give people the chance to really make significant progress on the path and also to become teachers, right, that can also spread the teachings. And that's the main purpose. It's all about helping people come out of suffering. And uh, it's something that, yes, I have started, but we are all doing together. And uh, it would be impossible to do that without support from the Bhikkhu Sangha, the monastic community, the monks community, and also the lay women, men, non-binary people, whoever you are. People who have this interest in the Dhamma and who realize, you know, that there's something a little bit missing in the sensory world. And sometimes something a lot missing, right? <laughs> and a lot of suffering included there so um, yeah so this is hopefully for everybody and not just for us but I do think that you know we need more representation in the Buddhist Sangha for it to feel really complete and really healthy because sometimes when uh, Buddhism becomes too institutionalized it can lose that sense of Dhamma and that sense of being for everyone you know being open to all so this is what I'm trying to do with your help. And uh, if you would like to be involved in any way, there's information at the back. You can make donations, you can support us to get a bigger place. Uh, in last year, about a year ago almost, we managed to get a little property of our own in Oxford, uh, a vihara, uh, which is basically a small monastery for myself and other visiting nuns and also any visitors who want to come and stay. So we do have men and women coming to stay and uh, it's a little community hub that we're developing. So you can come and practice with us, you can come and offer food, you can get involved as volunteers and of course you can help us organise events like this um, because I can't do it on my own and especially the more that I start to uh, run this little monastery and all the Everything that goes behind it, like the website and the YouTube channel and the charity that we have, um, it becomes more difficult to organise these things on my own. So it's really an exciting thing that I hope many of you might be uh, interested to learn more about. And, uh, and some of our volunteers will be there to talk to you a bit about that now if you wish. So um, just really want to thank you again, Ajahn Ramali, because it's the last day, <laughs> the last evening of the tour. And I know the last couple of days have been become kind of <coughs> after a long time here and all the trains and but you've been very patient proving that <laughs> monastic okay. do have yeah. some superpowers. Yeah. So you practice what you preach yeah. and it's just been a delight really to yeah. share this time with yeah. you and to yeah talk so much about the Dhamma and to meet all of you as well. So it's been really, really wonderful to be with so many spiritual friends. So Thanks to everybody yeah. here for making the last talk really, really nice. <laughs> okay. uh, we do have to head yeah. off pretty quickly because of the chains again. And we've got a ways to travel. So, But some of our volunteers, I think Elena and Gunter, will stay around and you can meet each other. And, and, uh, we'll see you somewhere soon. We have a, a day retreat in Cambridge. It's quite the other end of the country from Bristol, right? But we do have myself and Freddie Blupeta teaching a day retreat on the 17th of June and uh, there's lots of other stuff online that you can find out about uh, in the leaflets we have online uh, zoom sessions on like meta meditation sort of discussions and all kinds of things so, yeah okay bye 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 <laughs>